Hi, and welcome to Harvard Business Review's The New World of Work. I'm Adi Ignatius, Editor-in-Chief of Harvard Business Review, and each week on this show, we talk to executives on the front line about the future of work, about talent, about technology, and much more. So thank you for being with us. Uh, as ever, we have a great guest today. I will introduce him in a second. But first, let's quickly hear from our friends at Unisys. Your employees went from working in one place to working in so many places. Our digital workplace solutions can help them all create and collaborate seamlessly. We're Unisys, and we do digital workplace solutions really well. All right, so welcome again to the new world of work. Our guest today is Danielle Lamar. He is uh, a French-Canadian. He is the executive vice chairman of Cirque du Soleil a position he took after serving for nearly two decades as the circus and entertainment company's president and CEO. Cirque du Soleil, as many of you know, is a much celebrated place of endless innovation and adaptation. And Danielle this year wrote a book about how others can learn from Cirque's creative management techniques. The book is called Balancing Acts, Unleashing the Power of Creativity in Your Life and Work. So Danielle, welcome to the show. I'm so happy and honored uh, to meet you today. And uh, it's a great, great uh, time to talk about creativity and, and, and how we're going to innovate. So I'm blessed to have the opportunity to talk with you today. Well, thank you. We feel the same way. We're really glad that you're here. And, you know, j just to set context, could you talk just a little bit, just to set up the conversation about Cirque du Soleil's mission and maybe about how you came to the company? Yeah, this company, you know, uh, started uh, with a bunch of street performers begging at the corner of the street and move forward 10 years later. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to join the company when I thought the brand was ready to explode uh, globally. And that's what I've been doing for the last uh, two decades. Um, and by the way, uh, to our viewers, um, I'm, I'm speaking with Danielle Lamar, who is uh, former CEO and executive vice chairman now of Cirque du Soleil. If you have questions for Danielle, put them in the chat box, and we'll try to we'll try to get to as many as we can later. Um, okay, so 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 you come to Cirque du Soleil. It 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 has a mission. It has some initial success, but as you said, you're trying to develop it, to scale it, to blow it up globally. Talk about talk about that. The challenge of taking something that people love because it is unique, and maybe they love because it's small, but taking that brand and, and, and making it big. Yeah, and two famous, uh, you know, teachers from, from, from your school, from Harvard, as described it as in their Blue Ocean strategy, has, as, as we have developed a new category of show. And I truly believe that's what happened, and that's, that's how we've been successful. Because if you try to describe a circus show, it's very difficult. You will probably start by saying it's not a circus show. It's not dance. It's not theatrical. And uh, I would say that it's a blend of all of that. And at the end of the day, it became a very unique global brand called Cirque du Soleil. So, yeah, I, we were talking before the show and I said that, you know, my family fell in love with Cirque du Soleil. We were living in Hong Kong and we saw a couple of shows, Alegria and Saltimbanco, and couldn't believe them. I mean, this, this, this would have been in the 1990s. And uh, yeah, it, it was, as you say, such a departure. Actually, if people want to put in the in the comment box what their favorite Cirque show is. I, I'd be interested in what people say. Um, so, all right. So you mentioned that the authors of Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, Chan Kim and Renee Mobarn, had had mentioned that, had, had highlighted Cirque du Soleil as an example of an innovative company. And, and their whole idea is, is that you find, you know, a, a blue ocean, an undeveloped market that's brand new. You create a whole new category. So do you have any advice on, on people maybe who aren't in the circus business, but how to find an open space that's not being addressed already by business? Yeah, and, and, and really, you know, the motivation for me to, to, to write a book was I was motivated to promote creativity because that's what I've learned. I had the opportunity through all those years to see amazing and observing amazing creators such as our founder, Guy La Liberté, but also international people like James Cameron and the Beatles and, and, and watching them work. It has changed my personal and my professional life and really made my creativity uh, at the forefront of everything I do. 
And today, that's what I'm, I, I want to do. I want to promote creativity because, because I take a very radical stand, which is without creativity, there's no company, there's no organization. And I truly believe that. So let me push you on that. So, so how, how do you manage creativity? First and foremost, I think it's very important that you create an environment that nurture creativity. And what I mean by that is that you have to have your core business central in everything we, you do and in your environment. In our case, uh, you know, the founder hired me a clown called Madame Zazu. And Madame Zazu became a symbol of what we are. And internally, every day, I used her to remind our employees what our core business is. I'm not suggesting that everybody is, you know, hiring a clown. I'm suggesting that everybody find the right symbol to bring at the core of what they do a reminder of the purpose they have in life as an organization. So Ed Catmull, who was... Uh you know, the very successful creative leader at Pixar for years. Um, he, he talked about how at the end of every show, so he was similar to you, trying to unleash kind of extraordinary innovation and creativity with each movie in this case. But at the end of it, you know, he almost wanted to kind of wipe everybody's brains clear so that with the next project, they didn't fall back into it. Well, this is how this company does things, that there was a sort of freshness with every project. It, you know, is that something that, that you think about as you're, as you're creating new shows? Yeah, first and foremost, I, I don't think of Cirque du Soleil as a hierarchy uh, organization. And that's why every time we produce a new show, I will create a cell with all of our creators and artists. I, and I will say to all the administrative staff to stay away from that. I, didn't, I don't want them to think about, you know, some HR policy or some financial issues. I want them to really breathe and sleep and eat just thinking about making our next show very innovative, very entertainment. And, and that is very, very important that every show create an entertainment breakthrough. And that's the challenge I gave to the team every time we start a new show. And you've had an amazing record of success. Uh, you know, there are probably some shows that were not a success. You know, are there one or two examples you could talk about where, you know, that didn't work and, and maybe what you learned from that? Yeah, I think it's very, very important that you understand that, uh, you know, you take risk and sometimes you fail. And uh, in our case, I remember we wanted to, you know, reinvent vaudeville as we did with Circus. And uh, unfortunately, using the brand of Cirque du Soleil was a big mistake because people were expecting to see an acrobatic show. And, uh, and there were some learnings uh, from that. And, and, and we took the time to do the post-mortem and to evaluate why it didn't work. To make my long story short, the reasons why it didn't work is that we couldn't bring the brand of Cirque du Soleil on a vaudeville show. That was counterproductive. And, and that's something that we've learned and we will always remember, you cannot put your brand on any type of shows or in some situation or any type of, of product or, or, or services. So be very, very respectful of your brand. Yeah, you can stretch your brand, but but you don't want to stretch it so far that it's not sort of who you are. Um, so so you're talking about creativity, encouraging creativity, creativity, sustaining it. I'm sure there are people watching this who say, "Yeah, okay, fine. This is a circus company. You know, I work for whatever. You know, nothing that exciting." So you know, how, so how is your message relevant to you know the, the the large number of viewers we have who don't happen to be in the circus business? Yeah, first of all, yes, we are blessed uh, because Cirque du Soleil is a creative powerhouse. But, but, but my point is, is more fundamental than that. My point is it doesn't matter for what company or what organization you are working. You cannot use an excuse that you're not creative enough. If you're not creative enough, it's because you are not putting that priority in the forefront. 
I can challenge anybody in any type of organization. You can be creative in your employees' communication. You can be creative in your marketing. Most importantly, you can be creative in redesigning and innovate in the way you are shaping your new products or your new services. Uh, you, you know, there is no excuse. Creativity has to be at the forefront because if you don't do that, then one day you will wake up and you will discover that your competitors has an edge on you and then you're in trouble. So don't wait for that. Just make sure that you're nurturing your creativity within the organization to keep your edge, to keep your leadership in whatever sector you are. So you're, you're drumming up all that creativity within and trying to bring it out and celebrate it. You know, how do you bring in the voice of the, of the customer, of the consumer, as you're in this, you know, sort of creative mindset? Yeah, people will be surprised to see how an organization like us is so analytical. Every night, every show, we are asking the customer to react. And if for whatever reason we see that there is an act that is not liked as much as the others, we're just going to take it out and we're just going to replace it by a better act. So it's very, very important that you are listening all the time, listening to your customer in priority, but also listening to your employees. You have to send a clear signal to your employees that you are in the lookout all the time for new ideas, new suggestions. And that's what we're trying to do here at CERC is listen to our customer, but also listen to our employees and mobilize them behind the mission, mobilize them behind our new shows that we also share the credit when we have a big success. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see some good questions are coming in. And again, if you have questions for Danielle, put them in the, in the chat box. I, I have a personal question first, which is, you know, there's a passage in your book where you talk about when Guy Laliberté, the founder of Cirque, brought you into the company. And, uh, you know, you were already very successful in the PR and events business. And I think it was, it was your parents who thought, what? You know, <laughs> run away and join the circus. So, but, but talk about, you know, how, how, you know, how do we make these big life-changing decisions? How did, you, how did you make that decision? And what, what can we learn from that? Yeah, obviously, uh, my parents, even my wife at the time, was not really excited about me leaving my job. I was the CEO of a TV network and they were very proud of that. And, uh, and, and, and the one thing that triggers the change is, is when Guy La Liberté said, Daniel, I read that you wanted to be international and it, will, it won't happen to you for this, with this Canadian TV network. If you want to be international, you have to join the circus. And that was the trigger for me. So you have to be true to your value and through your ambition. And even if it was a tough decision for me to join the circus, it was an easy decision when I learned and, 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 and I, I realized that to become international, that was the right platform. And then after that, everything became clearer for me. And obviously, I never regret that because I had the opportunity with Guy to travel the world and promote this most important global brand. And I strongly suggest that when you are in front of a new opportunity, you should think about, you know, what's your ambition? Where do you want to be in five years from now? And I guess the answer will become clearer and your decision process will be much easier. That's great advice. So, so then let's fast forward. So you have this, this period of, of sensational growth, expansion, uh, and then COVID hits and live performances are not possible. You know, obviously the company is, is hit hard. You end up with a new sort of an investor structure. So can you talk about how you survived that period and, and where the company is now? Yeah, that was that was a nightmare. That was the toughest period in my life. And I know it was for a lot of people in different sector. But in my case, within 48 hours, I came from 44 shows to zero show, went from a billion dollars of revenues to zero revenue. And my purpose in life, I took great pride in creating jobs for artists. 
And then I end up in a situation when I had to let go, not only 2,000 artists, but all of our 5,000 employees. That was a disaster. And for 15 months, I was struggling to make sure that the company can remain alive. So imagine a meeting. You're meeting with, with the bankers. You have to tell them, I have no revenues. I have no shows. And by the way, I need 375 million more to sustain the relaunch of our company. The only reasons why I got their support and why I'm here now so happy about the outcome is the strength of the brand. It's the brand that saved the company because the bankers were convinced that the brand will make this company successful after the, the success, uh, after the crisis. And that's exactly what happened. So I'm going to go to some audience questions because there's some good ones coming in. And this is this first one is from George, who is watching on YouTube. And it's really, um, well, the question is, how can creativity be implemented um, in our own lives, you know, in our personal lives? What, what personal strategies can we follow to, to, you know, unlock that kind of creativity that you talked about? Yeah, I think I think it's important that we're beast of habits, as we as we all know, and that's what you have to fight first. You you have to do things differently all the time, and you have to find ways to be inspired by reading more, by visiting events, by talking to inspiring people. You know, people that I had the opportunity to meet, like the Beatles and James Cameron and others, has changed my life because they brought me some fresh air. They brought me some new ways of seeing lives. And, 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 and kill your habits, things differently, and make your life much more fun by meeting people that are inspiring, by reading more. And at the end, which is also very, very important, spend the time to reflect. We don't spend enough time reflecting. And I strongly suggest uh, that you do. And uh, that's what I've learned. And that's why my life now is fulfilled by more creativity, but at the end of it, much more fun. So we sort of take for granted now that, you know, there, there is this Sir, you know, Beatles show in, in Las Vegas and, and that it's amazing and so many of us have seen it. D talk a little bit about the process of of getting the Beatles and you know and and their heirs, their descendant, you know, their their people who represented them to 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 get them to an agreement, which was pretty difficult. I mean, talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, uh, you know, for many many years, uh, all the entertainment, all the live entertainment company were chasing the Beatles to do a show with their catalog, their music catalog, and nobody succeeded. And it took me two years of my life negotiating with them because it was not about money. It was about making sure that we will respect their brand. And, uh, you know, after spending quite a bit of time with the four of them, uh, including uh, Yoko at the time, uh, we showed them respect by, you know, working the creative process side by side with them and not position ourselves as the salesman of their intellectual property, but would position ourselves as true creative partners. And that's why at the end of the day, it ended up being an amazing adventure. Not only did we love it, but so did it because they, they understood that we were two creative power force that could work together and make something fantastic. And that's why I'm so proud of that uh, achievement. Yeah, in the book, there, there's more detail, more granular detail about that process. So if you're interested in, in Cirque, if you're interested in the Beatles, uh, if you're interested in Danielle, I urge you to, to check out his book. So I, I wanna ask a question, actually two people have asked pretty much the same question. Uh, Marta on YouTube and Hector, uh, who's in Guatemala. And it's really, how do you filter ideas? You know, what is the process, the creative process to pick a show idea, to decide the theme of, you know, the next show or shows that you're considering? Yeah, we have a very specific uh, creative process. It starts with three people. It starts with the director of the show, the creative director and the production director. And we give them a general mandate 
about what we are looking for in terms of the new show. The three of them come to us and present to us a first synopsis of what the show should be. And then when we agree to the general concept of the new show, then we will add to that three person's team probably 17 more, like costume designer, music designer, set designer, 20 people all together working together to define the exact content of the show. One thing that is very, very important in that process is we have regular checkpoint to make sure that the mandate we gave them, you know, at the beginning of the process is respected all along and they're not losing themselves with, with other uh, directions than the one we're hoping for. Uh, it's an organic process. Uh, it takes between 18 to 24 months to come to fruition from the day you start to the day of the opening. And uh, we're very respectful of time because it, it takes time to produce a good show as it takes time to develop a new product, a new service. And uh, that's, that's our process. So here's a question from Marta. I don't know if it's the same Marta, but Marta from Canada. Um, so, and I'm going to adapt it a little bit. So, you know, when Cirque du Soleil, you know, was first sort of out there, it was so different from anything we'd seen, and and it was amazing. And but her question is, you know, is it harder now to impress people, since you know you've already, you know, you've already sort of stretched the envelope so much? Do they want more and more? Is it, is it harder to impress them now? Uh, it is. Uh, it is because the expectation is are are much higher. That's why. Uh, we have a huge challenge to remain relevant. And the way to do that is by investing a lot in research and development. And that's what we do. We work in collaboration with a lot of universities around the world. We work with big companies such as Samsung and Microsoft and others. We are in the lookout all the time, not only for new ideas, but for new technologies. Human performance will remain the core of what we do but we will expand in new digital platform. We will expand on new technologies that are going to enhance the human performance. But it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge and you cannot be complacent and think that the formula you have right now will last forever because it won't. So you have to reinvent yourself all the time. And that's our biggest challenge, yes. So Richard in Italy has a question that really talks about or, or asks about what you just said about new digital platforms. And the question is, do you have any plans to perform in the metaverse? Yeah, we, we, it's, a, it's a world, obviously. It's a universe that uh, we are definitely uh, exploring uh, as, 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 we, as we're going through right now. Uh, one thing I want to be clear, we will remain a live entertainment organization because that's what we are great at doing. But on the other end, through the crisis, we have developed a platform called Circ Connect that has allowed us to keep our brand alive by showing different content on Circ Connect. So now we're going to, to go through Metaverse and other technologies, other type of platforms that are available to us and then we will have to define what kind of artistic content we're going to bring there to remain very, very relevant to that new uh, universe of technology. And yes, that's something we are definitely going to explore. All right, we will we will watch this space. By the way, I love the fact that we're getting questions from you know quite literally all over the world. And here's one from Finland from Jiri, and the question is, you know, how do you ultimately how do you measure success? Uh, we, we, first and foremost, uh, we have the, uh, you know, NPS, which is the, the, the net promoter scores. Uh, say simply, what we measure is that, are you going to recommend our show to your friends and family? And that satisfaction level is very, very important. And, and that's something uh, that we measure. So the first criteria, the most important one, is the satisfaction of our customers then is how it impact on the brand. Is your brand declining or is your brand growing? And that's something we measure 
on, on a regular basis. And obviously, the financial impact is also important because you need to be, you know, profitable if, if you want to remain alive, but if you want to have the right financial resources, uh, resources to, uh, to, to, to make sure that you can continue to invest in, uh, in new shows. So those are the three criteria that we, we look the most. Jacqueline, who is watching on YouTube, uh, notes that you said you share the credit when there's a success. So her question is, so what happens when there's a failure or things don't go as well? How do you process that with your teams? Yeah. Uh, first of all, at the end of the day, if you're the CEO of the company, you're responsible for the failures. So you have to tell to the group that that's first and foremost your failure, that you accept it but more importantly, that you're going to learn from it. Then you invite them to learn from it as well. And that's why it's important you have to go to a post-mortem, a good evaluation to define what are we going to learn from that failure. And, uh, and you have to understand that uh, you have to take risk uh, all the time. You have to mitigate risk, you have to measure risk, but you cannot be afraid of taking risk because you had one failure. Yes, you have to have more success than failures uh, if you want to remain alive, but, but you should take the time it takes to learn from your failure. All right, so we have a, a question from Quebec, so of course we have to ask that, and that is from Johanna, who asks you, other than your book, are there any other good books you can suggest on the, this topic of creativity? Yeah, there there is a book obviously of Catmull that uh, that that you talk about. I think it's a great yep. one. The guy from Pixar. Catmull, yep. uh, I would also recommend to read the book from Bob Iger from from Disney. Uh, I think it's a great book as well. Those two book uh, was uh, you know put a lot of pressure on me uh, because they were really really great uh, with two uh, amazing organizations. So that the two books that uh, that comes to mind. Yep. So in a similar vein, here's a question from Julia from Boston, who suspiciously, suspiciously might be sitting in the same room with me. But the question is, um, who inspires you? Uh, a lot of people inspire me. Uh, you know, obviously our founder, Guy La Liberté, but also a guy like James Cameron. I was so, so uh, rewarded to work with him on, on the live show that we did about Avatar. Uh, I was impressed by his uh, intellectual uh, curiosity. Uh, when he came to visit our uh, creative center here in Montreal, uh, I thought he will stay for an hour. He stayed for four hours because he wanted to know everything about our creative process. When Elon Musk went to visit our show, uh, Curious in Los Angeles, he stayed three hours after the show. Same attitude. He wanted to know everything about the technology we use, how we manage our artists, everything else. So the kind of people that are very, very impactful in our world, I've learned in watching them that the in intellectual curiosity is probably something that had really inspired me to be now uh, more focused and more curious when I have the opportunity to meet with people like that. Uh, Omar in Egypt asks, how do you envision the future of entertainment, not just Cirque du Soleil, but more generally, the future of, of entertainment, you know, in the next, you know, whatever, 10, 15, 20 years? Yeah, there are two schools of thought. Uh, one is saying, you know, the future is only going to be through new technology, new platform, and light, live uh, entertainment is going to be absolute. And the other school of thought is after the crisis, people uh, understand now that it's so, so important that you're going to see shows with real human being. I personally believe that the two school of thought are good. There will be more and more artistic content on new platforms, but I think live show will remain a very, very popular form of entertainment. And that's why we're pursuing both at the same time in order to benefit from the new platforms, but remain uh, a, a creative force for live uh, artistic content. So not everyone yeah. on your team 
is a creative. And there's a question from Shahid on LinkedIn. How do you balance, you know, you've got the creative people and you're always talking about them, you know, but some of your stars are operational people working quietly to make sure things happen. So how do you, how do you balance, how do you balance that? Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a today uh, challenge. Uh, because because creativity is at the forefront of who we are and we are perceived as a creative force. But the reality is we're also logistically amazing because we tour with 150 people for each show around the world with 50 trucks of, uh, of equipment. And in each city, it's uh, you have to be local because we are a, a retail outlet in a city for two to three months. So uh, those people are very, very important. And uh, you're right in saying that we have to spend also the time to recognize their contribution to the success of the show because they are integral in the success of the show. It's more like an internal challenge than an external challenge, but we're doing that. We're doing that because they deserve uh, our credit. And I always say like, Today, uh, it's the employees night uh, in Montreal, where we're going to show our new show to our employees. And that's the kind of event that we use to, again, thanks our employees for their contribution to the success of the show, wherever they are in our organization. So we talk a lot about what is the proper role of a CEO with a, with a complex company. And we have a question. Sushanya in Sri Lanka is curious. When you were CEO, you know, how, how did you spend your time? How did you spend your day? How, what were your priorities? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the good news is that I had a great team. And because I had a great team, it allowed me to be able to focus on mobilizing our employees. I think that's the number one responsibility of the CEO. Because if the employees don't believe in what you do, you're bound to fail and so that was my number one priority is uh i i love to go and and walk in the building and go to the studio and meet with people and more importantly listen to them uh, because you learn a lot by listening to your employees uh, you go in a city where we're presenting a show our employees have been there for you know a month they know more about what's happening in that city than I do from my office in Montreal. So that's something I spend a, a great time of, of doing. Then after that, obviously, reviewing the business model and uh, spending a lot of time in the new business and new shows development because this, th this is very, very important. But again, nothing more important than mobilizing your employees behind your new uh, priorities behind your new objectives. So we're going to Marta from Canada again. And her question is, can you give us a hint about your next show? Uh, yeah, first of all, I, I have to tell you that I'm very, very proud of our new show uh, at Disney uh, in Orlando because uh, we played with the intellectual property of Disney. That was a tribute to the animation of Disney. And, uh, and this is a great show. And, uh, and we're also uh, working right now on two new shows. Uh, one is going to be about music. That's going to be an arena show that, uh, that is uh, very impressive. And our new big top shows, we are going to shake up the entire uh, environment uh, within the tent that I hope uh, is going to bring uh, the customer experience to, uh, to a new level. All right, so we, we've gone over time a little bit. So, you know, there are a lot more questions, but I think we have to wrap this up. But Danielle Lamar, thank you very, very much for being on The New World of Work. Thank you to you. That was an honor to be, the, to be here. Thank you very much. All right, so that's great. That was Danielle Lamar, who is the former CEO and current executive vice chairman of Cirque du Soleil. Um, so I want to give a plug to next week. I want to thank all of you who are watching and give a plug to next week. Uh, our guest, this will be our last show of the season, so we're going to take a break after next week. But my guest will be Emmett Shear, who is the CEO of Twitch, which is, of course, the very fast-growing 
live video platform for music, for sports, for gaming, for entertainment. So we'll be talking about the creator economy and how that is changing the way we work. So that show will air next Wednesday, May 18th, a little later than usual. It'll go live at about at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Um, so see you then. Again, if you like this content um, and you're an HBR subscriber, please go to hbr.org slash newsletters and sign up for the New World of Work newsletter. newsletter. So thank you for being with us today. And this is the New World of Work.